Good evening. My name is Betty Lorenz, and on behalf of the Board of Student Advisors and Dean Clark's office, I'd like to welcome you all to the 78th annual final round of the Ames Moot Court competition. Tonight's case, United States of America, ex rel Douglas Dale, the Tech Corp, was written by Professor Charles Reed and Mr. Brian Tamanaha, and it concerns the constitutionality of the Quitom provisions of the False Claims Act. Presiding for tonight's case as Chief Justice will be the Honorable Anthony Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court, and as Associate Justices, the Honorable John Noonan of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and the Honorable Constance Baker Motley of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Arguing on behalf of the petitioner, the Carpe Diem team, will be Kathleen Mulligan and Ann Berlman. And on behalf of the respondent, the A. Bartlett Giamatti team, will be Matthew Krieger and Michael Dorff. We ask that those of you who would like to take photographs do so as soon as the judges enter and take their places. Once the first oralist is underway, we hope that you would refrain from taking pictures so as not to distract the oralists. Also, please refrain from any applause until all four oralists have been heard and the judges have retired to their chambers to make their decision. As those of you in the courtroom may have noticed, C-SPAN is reporting tonight's events, and the telecast of the argument is scheduled for Saturday, December 23rd at 7 p.m. <coughs> Finally, the BSA would like to invite everyone here to a reception for the judges, the teams, and their families to be held immediately after the argument in the John Chipman Gray Room on the second floor of Pound Hall. Thank you. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. We have one case uh, on the docket to be argued, United States ex rel Dale versus the Tech Corporation. Counsel for the petitioner, are you ready? And counsel for the respondent, are you ready? We'll hear arguments, please, from the counsel for the petitioner. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Kathleen Mulligan. My co-counsel, Ms. Ann Berliman, and I represent petitioner Douglas Dale. At issue in this case is the constitutionality of the Quitam provision of the False Claims Act. I will argue that petitioner Dale's standing as a Quitam plaintiff is consistent with Article III. Ms. Berliman will argue that such Quitam suits do not violate the separation of powers principle. The facts of this case are as follows. Douglas Dale is an investigative reporter for the American Herald. Through his own efforts, Dale discovered evidence that Respondent Tech Corporation systematically and fraudulently overcharged the United States government on supply contracts for computers. Based on this evidence, Dale filed suit under the Quitam provision of the False Claims Act, which allows a private individual to sue for himself and for the government. The government declined an opportunity to take over this lawsuit. Petitioner Dale's standing as a Quitam plaintiff is consistent with Article III. Quitam suits are as old as this country, and this court has passed upon such suits dozens of times without ever questioning the standing of a quitam plaintiff. It's important to your argument, as I understand your briefs, that the quitam plaintiff has a stake in the outcome? Yes, it is, Your Honor. I suppose the statute read that all of the recovery had to go to the United States uh, so that the quitam plaintiff was just pro bono, say that he got his attorney's fees, but none of the recovery. What result then? Dale's injury in 
in that he has seen fraud would still be re redressed because the so profits... Then it, so then it doesn't make any difference that uh, he has a stake in the outcome? He has a stake in the outcome in seeing that the profits from this fraud are disgorged, as well as a monetary stake in this litigation. So, th so the fact that he gets the money is just uh, not relevant to the analysis? The fact that Petitioner Dale gets money is relevant to the extent that it guarantees that Dale has an incentive to be an effective advocate before the court. So it, it makes it a stronger case, but not necessary for your case? Is that it? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Can I ask you one question? I noticed that the district court described uh, Dale as an agent of the United States. Uh, do you agree with that description? To a limited extent, we do. To the extent that Dale represents the government and the Attorney General has a large amount of control, maybe that's one way that you could view this as an agency relationship. An agency that the principal can't terminate? No, Your Honor. We we'll believe that, that the principal here, the Attorney General, has significant authority to terminate this litigation. But it's a, it's a, it's a unique kind of agency where the principal cannot uh, terminate the agent. Well, it's not a perfect analogy. But there are certainly so many ways. So you would perhaps repudiate that language of the district judge? To a certain extent, yes, Your Honor. I thought you were asserting that the uh, plaintiff's injury was the same as the United States. That is, he was in court uh, because the United States had been injured. For purposes of our first argument, yes, Your Honor. We believe that Petitioner Dale has standing as a representative of the government's injury, regardless of whether Dale is injured personally or not. We believe that Dale's standing may be analogized to the standing of an organization, for example, that is uninjured in its own right, but has standing to represent injured members. Dale's standing may also be compared with the standing of a trustee or a guardian ad litem, or even the attorney general, to the extent that these individuals uninjured in their own behalf, have standing to represent injured parties. All these cases of representative standing, which are like Dale's in that the party appearing before the court is not injured, but the represented party is injured, are consistent with the case or controversy requirement of Article III, as this court found in such cases as Hunt versus Washington State Apple Advertising Commission. Well, you, you distinguish Valley Forge. Uh by saying that the court was unnecessarily reviewing executive acts. That's what you say with reference to the standing argument. But yes, then on your substantive argument, we're going to hear from your colleagues uh, that it's necessary to enforce this law because the Congress and the, and, uh, pardon me, because the executive is not doing so. It seems to me that those arguments are in tension with each other, if not contradictory. Your Honor, Dale's case or controversy involves an adjudication regarding fraud. He is suing Respondent Tech Corporation. This suit it does not involve any judicial overreaching. Petitioner Dale's case or controversy is not asking you to review the constitutionality of another branch's acts. If Respondent raises the issue, raises an issue that must necessarily be, dis be decided involving another branch's acts, that doesn't involve judicial overreaching. Our case is distinguished from Valley Forge because we're not appearing before this court without sufficient reason to ask this court to review the legality of another branch's acts. Well, if you talk about judicial reaching, doesn't the citizen have an interest in ascertaining that the balance of powers among the three branches of the government are maintained? That's true, Your Honor, but this court has found that that interest was not sufficient injury for purposes of Article III. And one of the reasons that this was so was that this court has wanted to avoid unnecessarily reviewing the legality of another branch's actions to guarantee the proper role of the court. The case or, contra case or controversy requirement also performs other functions. It protects this court from having to enter advisory opinions, for example, and make sure that the disputes that appear before this court are ones that are heard in a form traditionally capable of judicial resolution. What we're adjudicating here is statutory, statutory questions. It's not like Valley Forge where this court was asked to understand the meaning of the Establishment Clause. Certainly not that the court couldn't do that, but we're presenting you with an easier case, just involving statutory questions. Could I follow up on standing? 
I noticed your opening brief uh, relied on the Scripps Howard case, the FCC case. Yes, Your Honor. And then your reply brief didn't mention it, and I wondered whether your adversaries had convinced you that that was uh, not a very firm ground on which to stand. The respondents tried to distinguish those cases by citing dicta from Sierra Club. We believe that they are certainly still good law. We are not pressing them because we do not think they're necessary for purposes of our argument. You don't take the interpretation that the court put on them in Sierra Club. We, we could analogize Dale's standing to that interpretation. The way Sierra Club interpreted those cases, they said that the plaintiffs had an economic injury and then they were allowed to assert the interests of other parties. To the extent that we believe Dale has a personal injury, this case is analogous because once he is injured, he has standing to assert the rights of third parties. So you could compare our case to that. And his personal injury is what? His injury comes from the knowledge of fraud, from seeing government waste, from seeing government resources wasted, from losing confidence in the government. Could a corporation bring a quitom suit under this statute? Uh, I believe yes, Your Honor. Uh, does a corporation have the same interest that you described the citizen is having? A corporation would be similarly injured by knowledge of fraud and they would share that interest, the same interest that a citizen shares here, in eradicating fraud. Uh, isn't there a problem, though, but then that the corporation would acquire an, a vested interest, an expertise, a continued pattern of bringing these kind of suits, which would give it the kind of uh, expertise and discretion that we usually require in the executive branch? To the extent that they would acquire expertise that would be problematic, in terms of um, bringing too many suits or whatever, there are still limits on what a corporation can do as there are limits on what any plaintiff can do. Well, but uh, it's important to realize you uh, hypothesize, in fact, you have the case in which you have this outraged individual pro bono type plaintiff. But I'm pointing out to you that the act and your argument would give standing to a corporation that did nothing but quit time suits. Well, the same could be said of a plaintiff who has standing under the Fair Housing Act. For example, under the Fair Housing Act, a plaintiff has standing when he receives misinformation or fraud. That's one basis. There are a variety of others. But it may be true that a corporation could bring a case. It may be true here that a corporation could bring a case. But Congress has determined that this is an appropriate way to enforce the act. And one of the reasons, indeed, that they passed this act was that the government was often coming against large corporations whose resources significantly outmatched those of the United States. So perhaps it makes sense to turn the tables here and allow corporations or private individuals who want the chance to eradicate fraud to have that chance. So we have permanent institutional quitom plaintiffs, in your view. Well, it's a possibility. It's not particularly likely, though, because these suits are expensive to bring, and they are, they are specially monitored by the Attorney General's office. And these suits that the corporations could bring could only be good suits. If they were frivolous, these corporations risk the loss of attorney's fees. attorney's fees. So just like any other plaintiff appearing before the court, there are risks to bringing litigation. It's not a cost-free type of analysis. Ms. Morgan, the, the Chief Justice uh, asked you a question that went beyond what you'd asked for in your brief, and I'd like to ask you a similar hypothetical. Yes, Your Honor. You referred us to Professor Winter's article on standing, where he suggests that standing is a recent invention, uh, mystifying rather than helpful. Do you think we should just brush through the, uh, all the uh, rubbish that's been collected and, and, and develop, a, get, get away from it. I agree with uh, Mr. Winter that the standing doctrine that's been formulated is very confusing. This court itself has frequently recognized that. Um, we are not asking for an exception to the personal injury requirement that this court has developed since the 1970s. However, we can't think of a better substitute. What we are arguing against here is the use of the qui tem Oh, excuse me, the use of the personal injury requirement, which is derived from the concerns that underlie the case or controversy requirement, when all those concerns are satisfied by Dale's suit. Dale is bringing a suit 
alleging fraud to this court. It's a suit under a statute, and it's in a form that this court can easily manage. It's not challenging the legality of another branch's actions. These are the, these are the concerns that the case or controversy requirement was designed to serve about the proper role and functioning of the court. Now, we're offering you two ways of saying that Dale's standing as a qui tam plaintiff may be reconciled with the personal injury requirement. You can either see him, either see him as a representative of the, of the government or see that he is injured in his own behalf. Well, Worth versus Selden was a case in which we imposed a standing requirement, and that was a suit by a real estate uh, developer against a state entity. There was no separation of powers involved there. The so, uh, and so it seems to me that your argument that standing is simply relates to the, the branches of the national government is misplaced. Well, Your Honor, the separations of powers concerns are one, but not the exclusive underlying factor in the case or controversy requirement. They've certainly been highlighted, for example, in Justice O'Connor's opinion in Allen v. Wright. But there are other concerns, we agree, and these include the functioning of the court, making sure that disputes are capable of being resolved. These are the concerns that were laid out by this court as early as its decision in Flast v. Cohen. We believe that we satisfy all these requirements, and the personal injury requirement is derived from them. The word injury is nowhere in Article III, and the modern doctrine of standing has only de been developed since the 1970s. Now, we're giving you two ways of reconciling Dale's standing as a qui tam plaintiff with these requirements. We are just challenging the use of the personal injury requirement where all the concerns that underlie Article III are, are satisfied. So our first argument is that Dale has standing as a representative of the government. He's just like all the uninjured organizations, et cetera, that appear before this court. Secondly, Dale is injured in his own behalf. Dale is injured, as I've noted, by his knowledge of fraud. I'd like to compare Dale's injuries with the injuries that a plaintiff who brings claims under the Fair Housing Act suffers. A plaintiff may bring claims under the Fair Housing Act when he receives misinformation about the availability of housing. There is no question about the, about the Fair Housing Act plaintiff's subject, subjective intent. It's merely a matter of whether he received misinformation about the availability of housing. Likewise, Dale is injured by knowledge of fraud. This much is clear from the legislative history, and the words of the statute. This, this, this injury is he can't go to sleep at night because he knows there's government fraud. Is, is, that, is that the point? It's hard for me to describe this. Um, well, it's, it's essential for you to describe because you're trying to establish that he has cognizable injury. That's correct, Your Honor. I mean, um, it seems to me that many citizens are very upset about many of the things the government does, and that's the whole point of standing, that there has to be a sufficient individual nexus with the plaintiff that's before the court. That's true, Your Honor. And any citizen, any citizen in the world couldn't appear before the court and just say, we're upset with the way the government is being running. But Dale is not like any citizen. Dale has standing under a statute which recognizes his injuries. And these injuries are sufficiently personalized because of the original source requirement in this act. Not any citizen can sue. Not, any, not even any citizen that knows about respondent tech corporations fraud, but only those individuals who are original sources of information about this fraud may sue. I see I'm out of time. I ask you to affirm the decision of the lower courts. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel, Thank I neglected to note, uh, how much time for rebuttal did you ask? Four minutes, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Yes. Counsel, good evening. Good evening. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Ann Burleman, and I will be addressing the separation of powers portion of this argument. Petitioner Dale is a private individual bringing one civil suit against a private party under the qui tam provision of the False Claims Act. Dale's actions do not offend the separation of powers principle, since, as this court has previously determined, the qui tam plaintiff does not prevent the executive from faithfully executing the laws. No explicit provision of the Constitution has been violated here. 
nor has Congress aggrandized itself at the expense of the executive branch. Of course, it is. It's well understood, is it not, that the Attorney General, the highest executive, one of the highest executive officers in the government, has discretion, and the reason he has discretion is to protect against the use of suits for oppressive purposes. Is that not true? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor, that is the case. However, the Attorney General has discretion over the use of government resources and government time oppressing citizens. And that's why the Attorney General, General is accountable to the people. We have a private plaintiff here, Your Honor, who is bringing a civil suit, just as private plaintiffs bring suits under the securities laws, the antitrust laws, or the Civil Rights but, Act. But, but what are the safeguards against misuse of this discretion by a plaintiff? who wants to harass the corporation in public, for instance, the, the, the corporate defendant? But there are um, safeguards built into the statute, Your Honor, which would deter a private plaintiff from wanting to harass, what for are instance, those the safeguards? corporation. Well, first of all, there's a fee-shifting provision where if the court finds that this is a frivolous or harassing suit, the um, fees of the defendant will be assessed to the quitam plaintiff. Yes, what, what else? The Attorney General, Your Honor, also has the ability to step in and take over a quitam plaintiff suit and limit the quitam plaintiff's participation in the suit. And is this part of the provision that the complaint be kept secret? No, Your Honor, this is not part of that provision. That provision is B4, which only restrains the government from intervening during a sealed period of time before the complaint is served. The Attorney General then has the ability to intervene later in the case under pre-existing law. Is, is the sealed complaint uh, provision uh, designed to prevent harassment of def defendants by uh, frivolous suits? Your Honor, the sealed complaint portion of the statute is there because the government was concerned that Quitam plaintiffs would be bringing suits while the government wanted to bring suits, while the government was pursuing some type of civil or criminal investigation. The executive brought these concerns to Congress while the 1986 Act was being looked at and passed. And so Congress passed this exact provision for the purposes of allowing the government to do some type of investigation. Well, there's the nothing really to stand. prevent the uh, plaintiff from announcing that he's filed this secret suit against the corporation. And then since the complaint is uh, supposedly sealed, uh, the corporation's really helpless even to know what the charges are, isn't it? Um, Your Honor, because the um, complaint is sealed, that's correct. The um, corporation would not know until the complaint was served what the exact charges were. So, so this Quitom plaintiff then has a discretion and an authority and a power that even the Attorney General doesn't have? No, Your Honor, that's not exactly the case. I mean, the Quitom plaintiff... The Attorney General can file a secret complaint? No, the Attorney General cannot file a secret complaint. But the Attorney General is the one, Your Honor, here who is keeping the complaint under seal. If the Attorney General decides no, the, to act... as I understood the statute, the court's required to do so. Yes, Your Honor, the court is required to keep the um, complaint under seal, but it's under seal so the Attorney General can decide whether or not to act. Well, if but the, the attorney, attorney General is never going to order that complaint unsealed if, it has a, if he has or she has a criminal prosecution pending. That's correct, Your Honor. Well, the Quitam isn't plaintiff... the most important consideration the fact that the Attorney General cannot prevent this Quitom plaintiff from proceeding with the action, that even when he finds that there's no merit to it? That is, if the Attorney General feels that there is no merit to it, what the Attorney General can do is keep this um, complaint under seal indefinitely. Um, for a good cause showing, the 60-day period can be extended, so the complaint is never served. Well, Ms. Merriman, I know the, uh, I guess it was the Court of Appeals that threw out an addictum that they would construe the statute to say that the United States could not enter merely for the purpose of dismissing. Your Honor, but I take it we could take the position and construe the statute to say the United States may enter Your to Honor, dismiss the suit. Now, how would you? It says in so many words in C2A, the government may dismiss the action, notwithstanding the objections of the person initiating the action. Now, why can't we focus on that provision? Your Honor can focus on that provision. It's definitely there within the um, act, which allows the government to come in and dismiss. But it would frustrate Congress's um, purpose here if you allow the government to come in immediately 
um, under that provision and just dismiss. And that's what the Court of Appeals was focusing on. Particularly, the Court of Appeals was focusing on the 60-day period, allowing the government to come in during the 60-day period before the complaint has been served, and having the executive, in effect, perform a judicial function by saying this suit can't go forward. Well, well how would it frustrate Congress's intent to let them come in later? It would frustrate Congress's intent if the government was able to do that, because Congress here wanted to encourage private suits to um, eliminate fraud in the government. And they thought that there may be, um, if there's a conflict of interest between the executive and um, the people the executive is contracting with, the Quitan plaintiff might be able to bring that conflict to light and bring these suits. The Attorney General, however, Your Honor, could come in under existing law, which the Quitan provisions do not preempt. And the Attorney General can go through ordinary procedures like Federal Rule Civil Procedure 24, which would allow the government to intervene and then move to dismiss. The government so could the, also... So you, you say at any point the government has a remedy for a suit it disapproves of? For, yes, a suit it disapproves of when it's brought before the court and the court determines the dismissal is warranted, Your Honor. And yet necessarily in a complex fraud investigation where grand jury investigation sometimes takes more than 12 months, uh, the government would have its hand forced by this civil suit, would it not? Unless it just got constant uh, continuances. Well, yes, Your Honor. I mean, there would be... the. The Attorney General, though, could keep this complaint under seal and can even stay the Quitan plaintiff's discovery. Well, in the meantime, the complaint's under seal while the plaintiff is announcing to the world that he sued this company and the company doesn't even have the ability to respond and defend itself. Well, the, uh, the defendant company has the same abilities as the Quitan plaintiff to uh, announce to the world through whatever... Um, An announce to the world that it's innocent of some secret complaint that is never seen? The secret complaint provision, Your Honor, was put into effect because that's what the executive wanted. They wanted to be able to keep these suits under wraps if the government was pursuing some type of civil or criminal litigation. And so while there may be problems that the Quitan plaintiff can say that there has been fraud and that the Quitan plaintiff may have said that there may be a suit going on um, that isn't official, um, certainly, and it's just like all the other media that goes on swirling around in this country. But other than intervening in the case for the purposes of trying to get a dismissal, the Attorney General has no control over that action as it proceeds, isn't that right? Um, no, Your Honor, that isn't correct. The Quitan provision itself provides for a great deal of Attorney General control over the Quitan plaintiff. The Attorney General can intervene at any time under the statute and take over the suit and be able to limit the Quitan plaintiff's participation, be able to even ensure the Quitan plaintiff does not participate at all, and can then settle or dismiss according to the C2A or C2B provisions. So the Attorney General does maintain extensive control over the Quitan plaintiff and may even initiate a suit on his own, which would bar a Quitan plaintiff from bringing a suit. So the Attorney General has complete discretion, or at least a great deal of discretion, over the Quitan suit. Can I ask you a question that yes, shifts sir. the focus a bit? Uh, it seemed to me that perhaps the real problem here was that this person representing the United States was not disinterested and uh, acting for the government was in fact uh, a highly prejudiced person by reason of his financial interest. As my co-counsel has alluded to, Your Honor, and as you said, the Quitan plaintiff does have the statutory bounty, but Congress thought the bounty was necessary as an incentive. Well, they thought it was necessary, but doesn't it offend due process? It doesn't to offend due process, Your Honor, because this is a private plaintiff. It's not a plaintiff exercising public power, such as a federal prosecutor does, who's able to immunize people, who can run grand jury proceedings, who can put someone in jail if it's a criminal suit. Well, now, how do you distinguish uh, Vuitton, uh, Young against the United States, ex rel Vuitton? Well, that case, Your Honor, was talking about, as you say, a private person, but they were talking about a um, lawyer who was sort of serving two masters, who had a client right there, who is trying to enforce an injunction to make sure that plaintiff got his client, got the money. And it, he had two definite clients there. He had the, the court who was trying to protect this. Well, but it seems to me Vuitton is um, one where the counsel has more independence than this one. Here, the plaintiff has a direct, immediate percentage financial stake in the outcome. At least in Vuitton, uh, we could rely on the professionalism of the attorney. Your Honor, I would feel that you could rely on the professionalism of the 
private plaintiff in this case, too, because the private plaintiff has a duty we, to We diligently. can recognize that plaintiffs have a professional duty to exercise discretion. I thought they were out for all they can get. That's the way I understood <laughs> plaintiff's laws well, as well. <laughs> they do have some kind of incentive here to diligently pursue the suit because the Well, that's the way life works, isn't it? Congress bought standing by giving this plaintiff a promise of money. Congress did not buy standing here, Your Honor. Congress felt that it was necessary to authorize the quitamp plaintiff to bring these suits on behalf of the government where the executive may have a conflict of interest and not want to bring these suits to light or not be able to see that there is a conflict of interest. And so it's not necessarily buying standing because, as my co-counsel has alluded to, the petitioner Dale has um, an injury on his own. The Attorney General also has control over discretion and policy making over government enforcement of this fraud. The Attorney General has certainly the power to determine where government resources are going to go, where government power is going to go in the enforcement of fraud. The Attorney General, as I said, even has the ability to stop meritless quitam suits, if warranted, through the existing rules. To implement Congress's mandate here, it's important. It's possible, I take it, that a quitom verdict uh, against the defendant can uh, give him a double jeopardy defense against a subsequent criminal prosecution? Isn't that the holding, in, the necessary holding in the United States versus Halper? Your Honor, the necessary holding in the United States Halper dealt with the government, and the court explicitly reserved the fact whether this would apply to private plaintiffs in a footnote, saying that they weren't sure if this was a dispute only between private persons. The well, Quitan but your plaintiff, whole point is, is that the Quitan plaintiff is representing the government. Your Honor, the Quitan plaintiff is representing the government and receives standing from the government, but once he goes and initiates the lawsuit... In other words, once, lawsuit, you get, uh, once you're a government official for purposes of standing, you forget about that for purposes of the substance? The reason the Quitan plaintiff is not a government official for purposes other than standing, and he, I would not even say he's a government official for purposes of standing, other than the fact that he's authorized to bring this suit, is because the Quitan plaintiff does not exercise significant governmental authority here, Your Honor. He's not using government resources. He definitely But I've just pointed out that he can, in effect, erect a double jeopardy defense that the government is helpless against. Your Honor, in United States v. Halper, it, the court reserved whether or not that is the case because they said that it may just be that this is private individuals in a case between two private individuals and double jeopardy may not apply in this case then. So he a collateral would, estoppel would apply, I take it. If the defendant uh, prevailed, I take it that would be an absolute defense in a criminal action. It may or again, is this a private plaintiff all of a sudden once he has government standing? He doesn't have he, he definitely is a private plaintiff, Your Honor, once he initiates that suit. Once he receives standing from the government, he does not exercise significant governmental authority. He is not a government official in that case. He is a private plaintiff going against a private, another private party and bringing the civil lawsuit. Just as I said, other civil plaintiffs do under the securities laws, the antitrust laws, and the Civil Rights Act. And so he's only wielding the power that's given to a regular private plaintiff. He's restrained by all the rules. He doesn't use government resources. He definitely doesn't have government power. Haven't you made some uh, little concession here that maybe there is an invasion of the uh, separation of powers, but we ought to probably just overlook that because this is uh, uh, these key Tom actions are more or less sui generis in the law and have roots in our uh, history from the very beginning and is an important uh, aspect of uh, the government's ability to, to root out fraud? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. Even if you were to find that there was some disruption of the executive branch, although in the United States, ex rel Marcus V. Hess, this court did not find that there was an impermissible intrusion on the executive's power by qui tam suits. Even if you did find that that was the case, there is an overriding need here to implement Congress's mandate to encourage these suits because, as I said, the qui tam plaintiff is able, particularly in cases where there may be a conflict of interest between the executive and a contracting party, to make sure this conflict of interest comes to light and this fraud is prosecuted and the contracting party does not keep these gains. And so it would be justified by an overriding need and also historical practice which has allowed these quitam provisions to go on since the beginning of our country. Well, you would surely agree there are many things that went on since the beginning of our country that became unconstitutional in the course of time. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. We're not saying that, that that renders this completely a moot question. That 
it is um, constitutional or not constitutional. However, history is very important, especially what was being thought by the framers when they framed the Constitution. And it is something that this court should consider. And it's something that this court has passed on other times and has not struck down these qui tam provisions. For these reasons, you should keep history in consideration while it may not render them concretely constitutional or unconstitutional. Because of the role the qui tam plaintiff does play here in bringing any type of conflict of interest to light, as I said, disruption, any disruption that may exist here would be justified by what role the qui tam plaintiff serves. Because the qui tam plaintiff exercises powers that are not significant governmental authority, and because none of the purposes of the Separation of Powers Act principle are controverted, you should hold this as constitutional. Thank you, Ms. Thank Perlman. You. Counsel for the respondent. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Matthew Krieger, and along with co-counsel, I represent the respondent, Tech Corporation. We are here today to urge this court to affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals, and we offer you three reasons for you to affirm that decision. First, I will argue that petitioner lacks standing under Article III of the United States Constitution, and therefore his suit must be dismissed. My co-counsel, Michael Dorff, will then argue that allowing petitioner's suit to continue would violate the principle of separation of powers, and that it would violate the Appointments Clause of Article II. If you accept any of our three arguments, we urge that you affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals dismissing petitioner's case. Turning to the question of standing, Your Honors, Article III expresses fundamental limits on the power of the federal judiciary. Federal courts are instructed to adjudicate cases and controversies, and that's a limitation not just on the sorts of issues which a federal court may hear, it's also a limit on who may bring suit in federal court. That's the Article III standing doctrine. And this court has clearly enunciated that doctrine in many contexts, whether or not those contexts impinged upon another branch's power. Do, do you accept the distinction between Article III standing and prudential standing? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. There is a whole other set of prudential considerations which might otherwise bar uh, someone from court. And Congress does have the power to remove those prudential considerations. But Congress does not have the power to remove the core requirement of personal injury and a distinct and palpable injury to every plaintiff who comes before federal court. Well, it's necessary for you to prevail to characterize the standing issue here as a core Article III standing requirement, is it not? Yes, Your Honor, it is. Um, if we accept that characterization, what is an example of a prudential standing rule that remains on the books? Well, Your Honor, the point is that even when the prudential considerations only come into play after someone has satisfied Article III. And those considerations normally would... I'm well aware of that, but I want to know which ones they are. If this is characterized as core Article III standing, then give me an example of prudential standing. Well, for example, someone is normally uh, not allowed to assert the rights of other parties once they are already in federal court. And that's something that Congress can remove, for example, in the tertiary cases, where once someone satisfies Article III, they may, may therefore assert other people's injuries. Why, why well. isn't that a characterization of this case? Well, it, 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 in fact, that is exactly what a uh, petitioner is trying to do. But that, the difference is that although Congress can waive that requirement once someone satisfies Article III, they may not do so if the person does not satisfy the core requirements. So I guess I'm, I'm agreeing that the prudential considerations might otherwise keep this petitioner out of court, too. But I also claim that the Article III considerations keep this petitioner out of court. No, the, the point of my question is that your expansive definition of Article III standing, it seems to me, swallows up all of our prudential standing jurisprudence. I don't think so, Your Honor. I mean, for example, if you look at the case of... Well, I'm gratified to know we have some of our precedents left. <laughs> Now, if you look at cases like, uh, for example, Havens Realty Corporation against Coleman, that was a case, an Article III case, but a case where this court looked at a congressional enactment that was intending to confer broad standing. And this court said that even after Congress had wanted standing to go to the limits of Article III, still there were p plaintiffs who could not satisfy the distinct and palpable injury requirement and were kept out of court. In fact, 
petitioners or the plaintiffs in that case could very easily have asserted the same injuries that the petitioner has asserted before this court. They knew of the racial steering practices. In fact, the white tester plaintiffs in that case had actually met the individuals and had engaged in racial steering practices, and yet they still were denied standing because those racial steering practices had not injured them in a distinct and palpable manner. And under the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, any citizen has standing to bring suit against an alleged polluter. Um, would you say that that st a statute is valid? We have not yet ruled on the point. That's right, Your Honor. I would say that what you ought to do when looking at that statute is to c construe that as a congressional attempt to confer standing to the limits of Article III. Now, that's a con it, well, the statute is not it would not be unconstitutional. In fact, our standing argument does not require that you hold the False Claims Act unconstitutional. All we are suggesting is that everyone who sues under the False Claims Act, and I think anyone who sues under the Water uh, Pollution Act as well, would have to satisfy the Article III requirements that the defendant injured them in a pr distinct and palpable manner. Well, then if a citizen in Massachusetts is outraged by pollution in the Gulf of Mexico, he cannot bring a suit? Unless he can establish some uh, injury to him in particular. No, that's right. He could not bring suit, Your Honor. Well, then it seems to me that you're saying that the standing provision in that environmental statute is unconstitutional in almost all of its applications. Well, it is unconstitutional in many of its applications, Your Honor. But that does not require that you strike it down entirely. Now, I'd like to, if I could, I ask We just leave it on the books, but don't allow any plaintiffs to bring a suit? <laughs> Only those who can satisfy the Article Three requirement. I didn't quite understand your distinction of the parole commission case, where the prisoner ceased to be in prison, but was still apparently a good plaintiff. Uh, how, how did that? How that was the he, class action case, Your Honor? Yes. How could he still be a good plaintiff? Well, Your Honor, the class action device requires that all plaintiffs, when they come into court, satisfy Article III standing. Now, there is a mootness problem, which Petitioner has um, alleged, which I think is really distinguishable from this. The point is that once the plaintiff, who has established standing at the beginning, if at a later date his claim becomes moot, at this point there's a class action going on, and the real party in interest is the class as a whole. So to remove that plaintiff and to stop the lawsuit at that point would prejudice the interests of the other class action plaintiffs, and that's what's motivating the mootness doctrine. But in that case, the, he, the named plaintiff, as every other plaintiff must, had to establish Article III injury. Now, you're familiar with Professor Winner's article. Uh, do you agree with him that standing, at least as a term, is of relatively recent vintage? The term is of relatively recent vintage, yes, Your Honor. And uh, would you agree further that it's a metaphor? Well, I don't know about the, the metaphor part of his argument, Your Honor. I think the, the uh, injury requirement and the standing requirement serves fundamental purposes, which uh, this court ought not to, uh, to discard. In fact, as we mentioned in our brief, it serves uh, several fundamental purposes. At, at its most basic, it's an expression of the limited power of the federal judiciary. Uh, federal judges are to adjudicate cases, and I think something inherent well, that's what the it, Constitution, but the, obviously where there's a, an ongoing dispute, there's a, uh, you can say there's a case. So what's, what's the additional uh, well, purpose served by this metaphor? I think that and it's something inherent in the idea of what a case is, is that there is a redress of an injury of the plaintiff who's brought before the court. And that's sort of what's essential in adjudication. And I think that's why this court has considered injury to be so essential to the case and controversy requirement. And as we point out in our brief, it serves the purpose of limiting arbitrary prosecutions. If the power of the federal judiciary is placed only in the hands of those who can demonstrate injury, and not into bystanders who are concerned or have observed things. Well, what do we do with Rule 17C, I think it is, that permits the next friend uh, to bring a suit under certain circumstances or a guardian, that kind of thing? We've long allowed that, have we not? Yeah, Someone yeah. to act as a plaintiff who was not himself directly injured, but was asserting an injury on behalf of someone else. Well, I think in those cases you can view the plaintiff suing as representatives as actually injured. And for example, in the case of a guardian, a guardian is appointed for an incompetent or a, or a minor or someone who couldn't normally assert his own interests in court, and that guardian has legal responsibilities for that person. Well, what about a next friend? Well, the next friend, I mean, I'm not aware of the provision which Your Honor refers to, but I imagine that that friend would have to establish a really close tie to the pl person who had been personally injured and could not sue if they just were concerned about it. Similarly, the doctrine of association standing, which Petitioner mentions, is in fact fully consistent with Article Three. Well, now, if this court were candid about its uh, previous decisions on standing, wouldn't we have to admit that it's been a very inconsistently applied idea and that the explanation lies in history and, and not much else? 
Well, Your Honor, the, the doctrine is relatively recent, and I think since uh, the, the Valley Forge and some of the cases in that era, it was put into, into good shape. There were these prudential and Article III considerations floating around, and the court finally crystallized that and said there's this core constitutional requirement. There are these other prudential considerations, but that's what it, standing is really about, and I think that doctrine makes sense. Now, I'd well, like to, well, if I can... One, let me ask you, Mr. Krieger, one who defrauds the government uh, is, is looting the public treasury. Uh, are, are you saying that the, the government owns the treasury and the people do not? Well, Your Honor, I'm saying that when there's a raid on the treasury, that does not necessarily injure every person in the United States in a distinct and palpable manner. And as these ca courts' cases and taxpayer standing make clear, that's simply just alleging injury to the waste of the government resources But it not seems satisfy. to me to be perhaps a more palpable injury than in the next friend case that Judge, just Mont Judge Motley proposes for your consideration. Well, Your Honor, I, I, obviously you could consider it that way. I would disagree. I would say that someone who was, uh, who was very closely connected with a person who had suffered personal injury would have a much greater connection than someone such as Petitioner who might claim that somehow his taxes will be increased as a result of the fraud but cannot demonstrate that in any, in, to any degree of, uh, of certainty. Why can't personal injury be defined in terms of interest uh, such as a plaintiff would have here in getting a reward if he succeeds? Well, Your Honor, a possible reward is, is just the opposite of an injury. It's some sort of bounty that he might get. And the mere fact that he can be rewarded for his suit does no, in no way demonstrates an injury to him. But it gives him an interest in the suit, isn't it? It gives him an interest. And in a reason to pursue it and to see it through, isn't it? That's right, Your Honor. And that might even satisfy some sort of concrete adverseness concerns, which are, are perhaps part of the Article III standing doctrine. But as this Court made clear, that's not the only part of the doctrine. But the doc let, me, let me follow up on Judge uh, Motley. Uh, I mean, why do you identify interest with injury? I don't quite follow, Your Honor. What well, interest? Well, she, she's pointing out there's an interest here, but you say it has to be an injury. And well, why, why, do you, why do you say it has to be an injury rather than simply an interest? Well, Your Honor, if, if that were the case, if an interest in some... Uh, in some a very action, concrete, palpable sum of money. It's not a vague that, uh, interest at all. It's a very... Well, the, the first answer, Your Honor, is that that's not the doctrine this Court has established. Now, you might Have we ever addressed that? Yes, this honor, uh, the court. I mean, looking at a concrete monetary sum and saying that is not the kind of interest that can set up standing? Well, for example, is there any case on that? For example, the Havens case, some of the white tester plaintiffs sued for damages, and yet that was not considered a concrete enough interest in order to uh, satisfy Article Three. But that, where they went assured of it. Here, the statute assures them of, of, of a percentage. I believe that the white tester plaintiffs could have recovered. They would have recovered damages. I mean, that's, that's what the Fair Housing Act calls for. So that was another damage. It, but perhaps more fundamentally, if Congress had the power to simply by rewarding plaintiffs to confer Article III standing on them, then what would really be left of the, of the Article III doctrine? Congress could freely evade it any time they wish, and there would be no irreducible minimum to this requirement. I'd That's like to, another case. I'm sorry? <laughs> That's another case. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I'd like to, if I can, turn to the other injury which Petitioner asserts. Petitioner claims that his confidence has been eroded, and his confidence in the government has eroded. And he also claimed before this court that his knowledge of the fraud somehow constitutes an Article III injury. But that simply is not the case. Erosion of his confidence, whether it is in fact true, is, cannot constitute injury because many people are concerned about, about things. And in the Valley Forge case itself, the, presumably the plaintiff's confidence in the government was eroded by, by the uh, connection with the church as, in that case. And in uh, the Fair Housing Act cases, you have plaintiffs who were suing, who were concerned, and were, their confidence had been eroded. But of course, don't we have a special concern here by we are dealing ex hypothesis uh, with a fraud? And a fraud is something that a lower government official is just not going to tell the higher ups about. And so Congress has said that we need a very special remedy for this. And it has recognized that this injury. Uh, will otherwise go uh, unremedied. Well, there could have been other situa there could have been other uh, remedies set up by Congress to to deal with the concern you're, you're addressing, Your Honor. For example, they could reward whistleblowers who come and tell the government about it um, directly, without necessarily allowing these people to sue, despite the fact that they hadn't suffered injuries. If they wanted to encourage tattling. In other words, there would be other ways it did that that wouldn't run afoul of Article Three. Do, do you know the fate of whistleblowers in the government generally? Well, these would be... These Do would they be, have lifetime tenure? <laughs> no, Your Honor. But these, of course, would be whistleblowers working for a private company, admittedly one contracting with the government, but a private company. And if awarded enough, I believe that whistleblowers would have the incentive to, uh, to 
to come forward. Why isn't it enough for the plaintiff to show that the government was injured? Isn't that necessary for a key time action to show that the government was injured? Uh, at the very least, in addition, perhaps, to the plaintiff? Yes, Your Honor. The, we, we will concede that petitioner's allegations um, satisfy a requirement that, the, that he's shown that the government has been injured. But I think what's important here and what's wrong with petitioner's argument about his representative standing is that Article Three, the standing requirement, focuses on the party seeking to have his case before the federal court, not on the issues he wants that court to adjudicate. So the mere fact that he has established a case in controversy between, between someone, some two persons does not give him standing to assert that case or controversy. Standing, after all, focuses on the particular plaintiff, not on the issues he wants to have a court adjudicate. So the mere fact that there's an injury to some plaintiff out there cannot satisfy Article Three. And if, if petitioner were correct about that, if injury to someone, not necessarily the plaintiff, could satisfy Article Three, then what would be left of the standing doctrine? Congress could freely designate everybody to sue as representatives of everyone else, and there would be no one who would be prevented from suing in federal court, whether or not they had been personally injured. And that's not the doctrine, and in fact, that would remove the irreducible minimum which this court found so essential in Valley Forge. Of, of course, there is an anomaly in our standing doctrine, is, is there not, in that for uh, centuries, uh, we've permitted plaintiffs with only a minor injury to, in effect, represent all the citizens. Gibbons versus Ogden had an injury with a steamboat, but, steamboat, but he set the parameters of the Commerce Clause. Isn't that what's happening here? Well, Your Honor, my time is up. Would you like me to address well, Certainly. Your... <laughs> OK. Um, the, the difference is those plaintiffs were not really tested under the standing doctrine. I mean, certainly there is a long history of, of qui tam actions, and these plaintiffs normally weren't required to satisfy the requirements of Article Three, but this doctrine is a relatively recent one, and now is the first chance for this court to address the, the convergence of the Article Three standing doctrine and qui tam. And we ask that you affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals dismissing petitioner's case. Thank you, Mr. Krieger. <laughs> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Michael Dorff, and I also represent the respondent, Tech Corporation. Good evening, Mr. Dorff. Good evening. I shall argue that the qui tam provisions of the False Claims Act, as they apply to this particular case, are unconstitutional in two ways. First, that they violate the constitutional principle of separation of powers, and second, that they violate the appointments clause of Article Two. Now, before you get into that, I want to ask you <laughs> why we should be hearing that argument. It seems to me uh, if there is a problem here, we should be hearing from the executive branch. Well, Your Honor, there is sort of a catch-22 at stake here. The False Claims Act prevented the executive branch from entering into this case. The executive branch, through its, its designated assistant attorney general, has stated that this is a case it does not want to be in court. But the False Claims Act doesn't allow the executive branch to be into court. And so the very problem that we're addressing is the fact that the executive branch can't be here. Well, why couldn't we just uh, put off submission of this case and ask the United States for an amicus brief that would express the sense of the executive on this issue that you've raised? Well, I, I presume that um, the executive would have would take a view. I don't know exactly what they would say. Well, we the don't either, but that's exactly it. Why shouldn't we hear from them before we let a private party tell us what has happened to, this, to the two branches there, there are, that you put into conflict with each other? There are, there are two related reasons, Your Honor. The first is that to put off adjudication would prejudice the interest, interests of my client. Respondent Tech Corporation is being asked to defend against a suit that the executive branch believes is meritless. And that relates to the second reason. The second, the second point is that the principle of separation of powers does not exist just to benefit the government. Ultimately, it's, it's a, uh, an idea that exists for the benefit of the people. Power is divided. Do you have any authority for that proposition in the well, case I, law? Well, I, I think um, James Madison put it, made that, that point in the Federalist Papers, and Alexander Hamilton as well. The whole idea of how about How about in the case law? Well, um, <laughs> the, the Mistretta case cites Madison's, Madison's point that the, the reason that power is divided is to secure liberty. 
Indeed, um, in, in this, this court's cases, the court has recognized that one of the reasons that the president is charged with the duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed is to ensure that arbitrary prosecution, that after all is the essence of executing the laws, that, that, is, that arbitrary prosecution does not take place. Does, I, does INS versus Chadha help you, in which we had uh, a foreign national uh, bring a suit which established a very basic uh, principle of separation of powers. Is that a helpful case for you? Absolutely, Your Honor. And indeed, um, as, we, as we point out in our brief, there was an argument made in the Chadha case, very similar to Petitioner's argument, that somehow the, um, the alien wasn't an appropriate party to bring forth the separation of powers principle. But the point here is that, that first of all, um, that principle is a structural provision of the United States Constitution, which binds, binds the entire government for the benefit of the people. Moreover, even if the executive branch of the government at this moment were to take issue with our position, they can't waive the rights of future executives. The, the mere fact, for example, that the president signed this, this uh, bill in the first place does not change the structural nature of the inquiry here. Well, even if, you, even if we didn't wait, you don't want us to wait, but, but why should we rush into a constitutional impasse if we can construe the statute to permit the United States to enter and dismiss at any time. Then most of your objections evaporate. Well, Your Honor, that, that is sort of our second best solution because it's clear that if the, the United States government had the power to intervene, this case would go away. And so in that case, perhaps it would be You'll a... You'll be quite happy with that result. As our, as our second best option. But our first best option, Your Honor, is, is, is even better. And that's the point that, the, <laughs> that, that to read the statute in that way would, would be to basically mangle it. And I'd like to take issue here with petitioner's reading of the statute. The point is that the False Claims Act, as was construed by the court below, and as its plain language indicates, isn't just a, an additional avenue for the government to have some, some ways of taking over cases and so forth. What the False Claims Act does is it sets up exclusive op options for the government. It establishes, first of all, in the first instance, that the executive branch, the attorney general, may take over a case if he wants to prosecute. And in that case, the statute explicitly, in, in part C2A, gives the attorney general the power to dismiss and some other powers. But if he doesn't take over the case, he doesn't have those powers. And Petitioner's argument that he can then later intervene and dismiss the action or take over it is simply incompatible with the, the, the text of the statute. If I, if I may direct the... Well, and, and as a matter of fact, if that happened, you'd be entitled to dismissal with prejudice, I take it, which would uh, certainly benefit your client, would might even uh, save your client from a criminal action. That, that's correct, Your Honor. If, if this court were to opt for our second best option and to construe the statute somehow, although in my view, contrary to its plain meaning, but to construe the statute to allow, allow for a discretionary dismissal by the executive, then this case would go away. However, there is a problem with doing that, and that is that it's not clear what the dismissal mechanism would be, because... Well, the does there have to be dismissal for good cause? Well, that, that's what I, what I wonder, Your Honor. In other words, the statute says that if the Attorney General takes over the case when he wants to prosecute it, then he can only dismiss um, for good cause. It's, it's subject to this. It, it, it's not clear. They don't, it's subject to a hearing. It's it's subject to a hearing, right. And I, I presume that the court would actually require some substantive showing at that hearing. It's not exactly clear what it would be. Well, but, then it's for good cause, isn't it? I, I would assume in that circumstance it is good cause. The point is, however, if this court were to sort of add on an additional provision whereby the Attorney General could dismiss a case uh, without taking it over in the first place, even though he believes it's meritless, it's not clear whether that dismissal would be subject to judicial review or not. And so we would be left with a difficult problem that always exists whenever the court strikes down what Congress has done, which is how to interpret Congress's subsidiary intent, so to speak. My point here is it's, that... It's a little odd that you're arguing uh, against the, the option for a dismissal of the suit against your client. Well, I'm not arguing against it, Your Honor. As I said, it's, it's our second best option. Um, but our first best option is just that this court should affirm the judgment of the court below. And, and the reason is that this statute, by eliminating the, the power of the Attorney General to make a meritless suit go away, um, has, has gone beyond what has been allowed in prior cases. It's, gone, it's fundamentally disrupted the executive's role. But if this court is inclined to, to somehow read in a, a, a dismissal power, I would argue, first of all, that that dismissal power should be absolute. 
And that's because there is this, there would still be a disruption of the executive's role. And that disruption has not been justified by any overriding need. Well, why is it the, that the executive branch has some sort of a monopoly on how the law is going to evolve in the United States? Doesn't the Congress have some say in this matter? In fact, isn't Congress the preeminent policymaker? Absolutely, Your Honor. Each, each branch has a role to play. But the framers of our Constitution sought to ensure that each branch plays its proper role. Congress defines what the law is. Having done that, it's not up to Congress to then say how the law shall be executed, except insofar as, for example, it provides funds to the Attorney well, General. it's not just a matter of executing the law. It's a matter of developing the substantive body of the law. And you say that the Attorney General has a complete veto power. Well, it's, it's, that, that, in fact, is what the Attorney General has in the vast majority of statutes of the United States. And it's not, it's, it shouldn't be viewed as something that's arbitrary. The point is that the Attorney General, the executive branch, needs that power in order to ensure faithful execution of the laws. Not well, but, but the Congress has said that uh, the citizens generally should have some role in deciding how the law should evolve. Well, Isn't Your Honor, that an, really an important principle of the constitutional system? <laughs> Even, even if you were to, um, to hold that this case should be dismissed, citizens would still play a role. We're not objecting to qui tam suits in those circumstances where the attorney general doesn't, uh, doesn't object to prosecution, but merely lacks the appropriate resources, for example. We're only objecting to well, you know, that, that, we, we, have, uh, we have a constitutional doctrine of separation of powers determined on an ad hoc case-by-case -case assessment of resources? No, Your Honor, it's not. The, the constitutional doctrine does not turn upon the ad hoc case. Rather, the point is whether the power is given to the Attorney General in the first place. If the Attorney General has the power to um, only allow those qui tam suits that he believes are, have some merit, then the Attorney General is faithfully executing the laws. The point here is that faithful execution of the laws requires more than mere mechanical application of statutory text to a given factual scenario. What it requires is that the executive branch exercise its judgment. It has to look out into the universe of actors who have uh, contracts with the government, for example, and say, is this the kind of action that Congress, um, in writing this particular statutory text, wanted to punish? And if it finds that it, that it isn't, then Faithful execution of the laws, the executive's fundamental well, so, duty. So you're defending uh, our, the, the, the argument that we strike down a statute in order to preserve congressional intent? Well, that, that's, it's a question of which... I, I have to absorb that for a moment. <laughs> Your Honor, Congress had several levels of intent. I, we, we do not disagree with the broad, the broad characterization that Congress intended to wipe out fraud on the government. And that is, that is a valid characterization of what um, the statute in its broad stroke seeks to do. However, as applied to this particular case, that, that goal of wiping out fraud on the government cannot, be, uh, cannot justify taking away the power from the executive to do what is its fundamental role. And that well, is hasn't the Congress provided for the executive to move in at any time and take over this case? Isn't that the... Uh uh, important consideration here well, that, the, that the executive maintains uh, power over the case. It can go in and take it over and do whatever it wants, and the plaintiff has to step aside. Isn't that right? Would that it were so, Your Honor. In fact, the statute does not do that. What the statute provides is that the government can take over the action only if at the very beginning of the case the, the Attorney General determines that prosecution is warranted. The statute says the Attorney well, General... Well, I thought uh, the Attorney General could intervene here at any time, as the plaintiff said, and um, also can intervene to uh, bring about a dismissal. You well, disagree with that? I, I do. That is what the plaintiff says, but that is not what the statute says, Your Honor. If, if Your Honor will, will address her attention with the Court's indulgence to um, part C of, of the statute. Um, it, it provides, first of all... Are you reading from the appendix? Uh, yes, I am, Your Honor. This is Which page? Appendix A, page 3, and then page 4. On page 3, the statute provides that the government may dismiss the action, notwithstanding the objections of the person initiating the action, etc., etc. Now, that language only applies in the circumstance where the government has first decided to take over the action. 
That's the clear import of the heading of C1, which says if the government proceeds with the action, it shall have the primary you responsibility. You mean initially and not at some later Th that's, time? That's correct. That's the only time the government can proceed with the action. Indeed, um, so, so, so pointing to that, if they proceed with the action, then they, the, the qui tam plaintiff has certain rights limited by these later provisions. Now these later provisions, C2A and B, only apply where the government first takes over the action. They don't apply if, as is uh, pointed out in um, C3, if the government elects not to proceed with the action. And that's on the next page. If the government elects not to proceed with the action, all the government may do is later, yes, intervene, but they can't take over the action and they can't dismiss the action. So petitioner's reading of the statute is simply incompatible with its text. Well, doesn't the uh, Attorney General have more control when you add it all up than the Attorney General has over the special prosecutor and the special prosecutor is appointed? No, no, he doesn't, Your Honor. Not in a case such as this one. Mor Morrison against Olson asked, uh, in, in Morrison against Olson, this court said that the correct inquiry is to look to the statute as a whole. But that doesn't mean that you ignore the particular facts of the case. So the, the point is that the fact that the Attorney General might have adequate powers to supervise or control uh, a different qui tam plaintiff can't possibly mean that he has adequate, um, that, it, that it's okay if he doesn't have enough powers to supervise this qui tam plaintiff. So, so that's a, an important distinction. And in the special prosecutor context. So you think the statute might be unconstitutional as applied in this case? And that is, that is precisely correct, Your Honor. If, for example, this were a case in which the government had, um, had said, we decline to take over the action, but we have no objection to, going, to the case going forward, that would pre present a much different case from this one. Um, this is a limited challenge to, specific to the facts of this particular case. If I may, I would now like to turn to the, the so-called overriding need portion of the separation of powers inquiry. Now, Petition, counsel for Petitioner justifies this, this statute as saying it serves the overriding need of combating fraud. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, that overriding need is not specific to the elimination of the crucial power that, that this court has always required the executive to have, the power to um, prevent the unwarranted exercise of executive authority. Indeed, as is clear from this court's prior precedents, an overriding need is one which is so important that it may be characterized as inherent to the provision at stake. Was there an overriding need in Vuitton versus Young? In, in Vuitton against Young, this court um, found that the particular exercise of, of authority by the, the person suing to enforce um, the contempt uh, was, was problematic. Um, there, there was a, a difference. Well, I, 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 I thought that we expressly acknowledged that the appointment of a private prosecutor was appropriate in that case. That's, that's not that prosecutor because he had a financial interest. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. That, that, of course, is an important distinction between that case and this case. And well, that I is understand that distinction, but the principle is, and we established it in Vuitton, that the court could appoint a private prosecutor without asking the Justice Department, without an assessment of resources, without any showing that the Justice Department was even unwilling to prosecute. That's correct. And that's because Vuitton dealt with a very essentially judicial function of, of contempt. This court carefully distinguished the power to prosecute contempt traditionally. Oh, you mean the judiciary can make up rules on its own and the Congress of the United States can't provide the same thing by statute? No, Your Honor. That, that's not what I mean. What I, what I mean is that Historically, it's been understood that, and, and in fact it's true today as, as well as, as at any point, that in order for a, for a court's judgment to be enforceable, the court must have some inherent power to enforce it that doesn't rely on the executive branch. In a sense, it's, it's serving a separation of powers principle. Congre it's, Congress uh, could not abolish criminal contempt as they chose? Um, I think that, that would present a difficult problem. Perhaps. Perhaps well, you're saying there's some inherent power to punish for criminal contempt? Well, perhaps, perhaps criminal contempt if they, they allowed civil contempt to remain. Um, the, the, point, the point there, Your Honor, is that the Vuitton case was limited to punishing contempt. It did not establish a broad principle that any, that any time um, the, 
the, a judge wants to appoint a, a private prosecutor, that private prosecutor doesn't in any way implicate the government. There's another, another important distinction between Vuitton and, and this case. In Vuitton, the, um, the private prosecutor appointed to enforce the, con the, the contempt prosecution is acting really as, as an arm of the judiciary. Here, the Quitam plaintiff is acting as an, uh, on behalf of the United States government, bringing the action in the name of the United States government. And in my last few moments, I'd like, if I may, to turn to the, the third independent part of our argument, and that is that this exercise of governmental authority by the Quitam plaintiff violates the explicit provision of the United States Constitution, the Appointments Clause. The Appointments Clause of Article 2, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, as this court stated in Buckley, has substantive content. Any individual... Well, but Counsel, Buckley involved an agency with uh, ongoing life, with acquired expertise, uh, with acquired discretion. Here we have a one-time plaintiff. Well, Your Honor, First of all, I, I do not contend that, Buck, that Buckley controls this case. What I contend is that the principle of Buckley uh, applies to this case. And I think I can demonstrate that by comparison with the Morrison case. In Morrison, this court noted that the independent counsel was an inferior officer of the United States government. Now, that, was, that wasn't a problem because uh, the court held that the independent counsel had been appointed in conformity with Article II. However, um, in, an independent counsel might bring just one case, for example. So the fact that the, the person exercising governmental authority does so for a short time doesn't make that exercise of governmental authority immune from the appointments clause. For example, if a statute were to designate someone as attorney general for a day, that person would, and, and without, without going through the appointments process, that would be a violation of the appointments clause, even though the person exercised governmental authority for only one day. At its core, the appointments clause establishes a principle of governmental regularity. That's what this court must have meant in Buckley when it said that the term officer has substantive meaning. It's not merely a formal provision about um, protocol, if you will. What it states is that when someone exercises governmental authority, bringing a lawsuit on behalf of the United States government, that person must in some way be accountable through the government. Because the qui tam plaintiff is not accountable at all, the qui tam plaintiff indeed has an incentive structure that, as we have pointed out, is antithetical to the responsible exercise of prosecutorial authority. The qui tam plaintiff violates the appointments clause and, in this particular case, also the separation of powers principle. I, I urge this court to affirm the ruling of the court below. Thank you, counsel. Petitioner's rebuttal. Ms. Mulligan. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, in my brief four minutes, I'd like to go over a number of ideas as quickly as possible, starting with the separation of powers argument. Now, the respondents have come up to you and said that they would be satisfied that their second best option would be that the government can intervene and move to dismiss this lawsuit. We agree that the government has this power. Now, the respondents cited for you two provisions that were at issue in this case. The B-4 provision, which applies to the government's intervening and taking control during the 60-day period that occurs before a defendant answers a complaint, and the C-3 provision, which applies at any time during the act when the government for good cause has reason to wish to intervene and take control of this litigation. We both agree that both of those provisions allow the government to intervene and take control of the plaintiff's suit. That's an extraordinary authority that the government doesn't have in other types of litigation brought in the public interest. But these two provisions do not preclude the government from intervening in ways that is normally been capable of in all other types of public interest litigation. The government can intervene and move to dismiss under Rule 24 here. The government can appear as an amicus curiae. The government, the executive even has a presidential pardon power so that when a suit is particularly egregious, the government can pardon that offense. None of these provisions were preempted by this act. And certainly the courts have not interpreted this act as, as preempting those types of provisions. In Marcus, before the 43 amendments were passed, the government appeared as amicus curiae. Before the 86 amendments were passed, 
In Thompson v. Hayes, the court allowed the government to appear as an interested party. And just this summer, after the 86 amendments were passed, the government was allowed to, was allowed to appear as amicus curiae in the Newsham v. Lackey case, case. No judge that has interpreted this act has want the type of argument the respondent is trying to convince you of, that this act precludes all other types of intervention by the executive. The only thing that the executive cannot do under this act is dismiss a suit that, that is meritorious. And there's no reason that the executive should have that power. The executive is not using their resources here. It is a suit I in the Suppose it's interest. concerned about protecting the integrity of a pending criminal action. First of all, the act allow the act gives the executive a number of ways to control to control the suit. For example, it can stay discovery if um, other litigation is pending. Also, the the initial provision before the defendant answers the complaint allows the government to keep this complaint under seal while the other efforts are going on. And on top of that, under Rule 24, the government could could appear and move for a dismissal. The government could also argue as amicus. There are all these powers that the government has. They were certainly sufficient in other citizen suits to protect the executive's interests. They're sufficient here. So we believe that there are no separation of powers concerns raised by this act. Turning back to the standing argument, respondent would have you believe that for some reason petitioner does not have standing under the act. He, they talk about um, cases about citizen suits where this court has not struck down a citizen standing provision but has denied standing to a plaintiff that doesn't have injury. But they aren't challenging our standing under the act. Um, petitioner claims that he is an original source of information, that that sufficiently particularizes his claims and um, satisfies the case or controversy requirement. They don't challenge that. They don't challenge that we're the original source of information. But even if you disagree with us that the injury is not sufficiently per personalized here, we still may assert the injury of the government and this court held in hunt that asserting the injury of a represented party satisfies the case or controversy requirement. We believe that this suit is consistent with both the, the Article Three requirements and the separation of powers doctrine. We ask you to affirm the, or reinstate the decision of the district court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much, counsel. The case will be submitted. We will now take a recess for approximately five minutes, and then we will return. Thank you. The judges will be returning shortly to render their decision as to best brief, best oralist, and best overall team. The BSA would like to congratulate the participants on their efforts throughout the Ames competition. Once again, we'd like to invite everyone to the reception in the John Chipman Gray Room at the conclusion of the argument. Thank you. All rise. Thank you very much. It is a, a great pleasure not only to be here at the Ames competition uh, and at Harvard 
and uh, really one of the great moot court competitions uh, in the history of American legal education, but to be with my uh, two colleagues. Uh, Judge Motley, you and I have been on the UCLA court, moot court, and the Yale moot court, and we finally made the big time. <laughs> And, and it is my, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Judge Constance Baker Motley of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Judge. Thank you. Uh, I think I have to agree with uh, Mr. Justice Kennedy that uh, Harvard is where it's at. As they say in the street, uh, we have been in other parts of the country, and we've seen others perform. And um, I must say, uh, I am always impressed when I do come here to Harvard uh, that um, you uh, have some of the greatest future members of the bar right here. Uh, we always say when we uh, meet after such an argument, if only we had lawyers in court like this. <laughs> it is a rare day indeed that we see an argument uh, such as we have seen tonight. And this kind of uh, experience, I think, is what keeps us going. Uh, that is, we come here and we see the future bar, and we realize that uh, the legal profession in this country is a profession which continues to attract the ablest people in the country. So I want to thank you for renewing my, uh, what shall I say, faith and the future of the uh, legal profession. and. Uh, Congratulations to all of you who participated. Thank you, Judge. It's an honor to be with you. It was very gracious of the members of the Board of Student Advisors to uh, ask uh, to serve on the panel tonight. Uh, my former colleague, uh, a remarkable teacher, and, uh, and, and, a, and a just a very, very fine judge on the great United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Judicial Circuit, uh, Judge John Newman. Judge? I must say this seemed like a return to old times because I began my judicial career with Justice Kennedy presiding, and that was a very uh, happy introduction. I want to say this has been about as close a uh, competition as I've uh, participated in, uh, both at the level of the briefs and the level of the um, oral argument. Uh, judges are paid to be decisive, so the fact that we decided quickly is simply because we're decisive judges, not because it wasn't a very close contest. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. I think Justice Kennedy should announce the decision. The problem that you argued uh, is a very real problem, and I congratulate the authors uh, for presenting this to you as your moot court case. The que it's no paradox, uh, it's no strange event that one of the most ancient actions in the law should present a modern constitutional dilemma. Because what we're dealing here with are some very basic human weaknesses and vices, fraud and corruption that have been with us since the beginning of civilization plus the outrage demand of a decent citizen to do something about it. And when you have these strong feelings and congressional action, you then run into the additional problem of whether or not the Congress has respected the separation of powers. You can see from the problem that it may well depend. It's an interesting problem in the limits of judicial notice. 
do we take this plaintiff uh, as this outraged citizen, this voice crying in the wilderness, or is what is in the judicial mindset the idea of a permanent corporation, a foundation that would do nothing but these qui tam suits? There are also problems with the First Amendment and with free speech. Uh, with reference to sealing the documents, many things uh, that are ancillary. So it was a very, very good, good moot court problem. Uh, the, it's almost ritualistic uh, for uh, moot court visitors uh, to tell the students how well, how well they did. Uh, in this case, uh, it is, is very true. The, the arguments here were, were simply superb. This profession of ours distinguishes itself by its ability to advocate and to argue and to persuade. And you saw that art here being practiced in its highest form, fully consistent with the tra traditions of our profession and of this great school. I was going to do a moot court some years ago and my 16-year-old daughter, who by reason of her age uh, is omniscient, uh, sent uh, said, said uh, oh well, it must be uh, uh, enjoyable for you to go to something that's not the real thing. Well, she's wrong, this is the real thing. The law evolves in many ways from many sources. And you heard the law discussed here tonight in a way that uh, all of the judges, uh, and I'm sure all of the audience, found most instructive and most insightful. So I wish to congratulate uh, each of you uh, who, who participated in this long and this, in this wonderful Ames competition. I spent quite a bit of time uh, with the briefs and uh, talked to Judge Noonan uh, this morning about them and then we talked to Judge Montley earlier. So uh, we had in mind what, uh, what we thought uh, was the best brief. And uh, we've given, uh, although it was very, very close, and we, we debated about it to some, some length this morning. We gave the award uh, for the best brief uh, to the respondent, the A. Bartlett Giamatti team. Congratulations. Uh, the best oralist, uh, again, uh, uh, very, very difficult. Uh, and we have, um, d despite what I thought was a, a, a very brilliant rebuttal by Ms. Mulligan, uh, selected as the best oralist, Mr. Dorf. Would you please stand, Mr. Dorf? And it naturally follows that you squeak away with the best team award as well. We're anxious to meet you and to congratulate each of you. Thank you very much for your kind attendance.